All right, good afternoon, folks. Um, my name is Sean Lindersay, and this is Charles Mars, and we're both uh, program managers on the Microsoft Edge team. And uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, Microsoft Edge. We're going to talk about, um, we'll cover sort of year one of Microsoft Edge, because we're getting really close to, to that date. Um, we'll talk about what's coming in what I hear is now called the anniversary update um, of, of, of Windows. Um, and even too, we, we learn things from the keynote too. It's, it's <laughs> nice. um, and we're going to talk about for web developers and for the enterprise and for uh, web developers. And so we'll give a kind of a broad overview of that. All right. Uh, Microsoft Edge, year one. So uh, a little less than a year ago, we we'll cast our minds back. Um, we, we were here, this very place, and some guy with way too much hair. Um, <laughs> announced Microsoft Edge, and it was sort of a, the beginning of a new era for That wasn't me, right? Us. What's that? That wasn't me, right? No, no, okay, no, sorry. it was the other guy. <laughs> but he's on a boat right now. Um, <clears throat> some guy, yeah, so, uh, Joe Belfiore, that's what I mean. Just um, so he announced uh, a Microsoft Edge, and you know, was the browser for getting things done, lots of great new features. Uh, I did want to share a couple of great tweets, my absolute favorite tweet, so hat tip to the social media team at Ford who came up with this on the spur of the moment. You really can't go wrong with Explorer or Edge. That was kind of <laughs> genius. Um, and then, of course, uh, August was our you know, the 20th anniversary of IE. So we sort of complete that transition from Internet Explorer to Microsoft Edge. So um, one of the questions we keep getting, so just throw that away, right? That's, that, that's it for my PowerPoint tricks for today. <laughs> I used to work on the PowerPoint team, so I just can't resist it sometimes. But people keep asking us, they asked us then, they ask us now, so why build a new browser? I mean, 20 years in another browser, a lot of browsers in the marketplace, why do, why do we feel like we need to build a new browser? So just quickly recap that, there were two main reasons. The first was a sort of break from the past, and I'll talk about that in a second, and to really get ready for the future of, of what the, uh, the browser, a browser needed. So to recap a little bit, you know, if you cast your minds back to a year ago, I guess, there was IE 11, and what we've been doing probably since about IE 7 through IE 11 was really trying to thread this needle of interop and compatibility, where interop is making the browser work the same way other browsers work, and compatibility is making it work the, the way every previous version of the browser worked. And so we kept trying to sort of thread that needle. We had these things called version dock modes, which some people called sort of running a browser inside of a browser. And um, people had to sort of figure out, well, which dock mode did I want or need or um, should use? Uh, we also had support for ActiveX controls, remember those? Um, BHOs, toolbars, and a, and a variety of technology that actually had existed in IE for nearly 20 years in some form or other. And we had a single browser that we targeted for modern HTML websites, for intranet sites, and for, for enterprises as well. So in Windows 10, what we did was we, we, we saved ourselves a bunch of trouble and created some other sort of complexities as well at the same time. We, we separated that. We said, okay, we're going to take Internet Explorer and we're going to kind of put it in a box. And that thing is what we will use for compatibility. Because we know, and developers know, that that works a particular way. So we won't change it. And that's the way that you get support for ActiveX controls. That's the way we get support for BHOs and toolbars. And it's really targeted at intranet sites or, or using um, enterprise mode. So it's, it's really for compatibility. And the best way for us to sort of keep that compatibility and ensure that compatibility was to have it be a separate browser. Microsoft Edge, with its new engine, Edge HTML, that we targeted interoperability, basically working the way the web is supposed to work. Um, so working, trying to make sure that we work the same way that other browsers, browsers do. We made that the default browser in Windows 10. We started work on new JavaScript-based extensions, which um, we are, if you were using our Insider Preview, we just uh, released our first preview of it a week or two ago. I'll show some more on that a little later today. Um, we put ActiveX and BHOs and toolbars, and we said they don't run in this environment, which gave us a more reliable, secure, faster, more responsive browser. And we said this is the browser for the modern web. And that's where we, that's where we are today, and that's what we've been moving forward with. Microsoft Edge is the default browser, and then IE 11 is still there, part of the product, targeting for enterprises and compatibility. <clears throat> so as we went forward, as we continue to go forward, these are sort of the three design tenets that we really hold firm to. The first is, build an amazing browser. And we know that we can't just you know, have great, cool new features. We gotta have a browser that meets people's expectations. It's secure, it's fast, it's reliable, it's responsive, it has all the web standards people expect it to, it has all the features that people expect them to 
to have. So that was sort of really a core tenet. We have to be an amazing browser. The second thing we said, we need to be bold and forward looking, which means skating to where the puck is going, trying to look at what's sort of happening in, in, the, in the industry, in the environment, in users' environments, and really try to build some features that, and some um, uh, uh, the product that tries to expand the definition of a browser. So for example, we really looked really hard at what it means to have a pen and a browser, not just using a pen for you know, clicking on links, but this idea of being able to write on the web with web notes. So that was a, you know, a, a kind of innovation and experimentation and some deep thinking we had around a particular scenario. Another area we looked at was sort of, if I have a personal assistant, you know, Cortana is there, we've heard a lot about Cortana. What does it mean to have a personal assistant help you while browsing on the web? And so we did a bunch of exploration around that. I'll show you a couple of the new things that Cortana does since last year. Um, but again, that was a, a, us being forward looking. The third and possibly the most important thing that we did, decided was we needed to ship fast, try new things, and learn, and then constantly get better. I'm gonna talk, um, Charles is gonna talk a little bit about that as we go forward, because that's actually really the essence of what's ha sort of happened over the last year, is this core third tenant. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, so, as Sean mentioned, uh, it was about a year ago, actually 11 months ago, that we were right here announcing Microsoft Edge to the world. Uh, but it, we actually had a few more months to finish off the initial release of Microsoft Edge and Windows 10, um, which released, as you know, on July 29th last year. And since then, it's really been a really fast and exciting eight months until uh, today that Microsoft has been, Microsoft Edge has been on the market. So if last year the question was, why did you build a new browser, then I think this year the question that we're getting a lot is, so you know, how is that new browser thing going for you anyway? So uh, I thought it'd be good to start out here by just sharing some of the metrics that we look at um, and, and kind of evaluate ourselves using uh, to kind of share the view that we have in, in terms of how things are going. So the first one is monthly active devices. So if you've worked on any kind of service, this is familiar terminology to you. Um, since we started shipping Windows as a service, it's terminology that we use as well. So instead of talking about an install base, you know, how many installs of Windows we have, we talk about monthly active devices, how many people are actually using your product in the last month. So this is a super important metric for us, and so it's interesting to look how we're doing here. So actually, after just eight months, uh, I'm pretty amazed to, to say that we have over 150 million monthly active users of uh, Microsoft Edge. So this is a pretty incredible number. Uh, the team I know back in Redmond is very humbled by this and, and really feels a responsibility to keep moving the product forward for these users. So monthly active is not enough, of course. We need you know, all of you who run websites and web apps we need you to start seeing Microsoft Edge in your web traffic. And so we're definitely keeping an eye on external third-party metrics as well, um, and really looking for the momentum uh, behind the traffic, because we know it takes time to build up um, that momentum behind a brand new browser. And we're starting to see that. So this is data from Net Applications, which is, which is a third-party web analytics firm. And they showed that from mid-January to mid-February, just one month, uh, they actually published some data that said that Microsoft uh, Edge traffic on the internet doubled in just one month. So I think we're definitely starting to see this momentum building out in the marketplace. A uh, third thing we looked at, uh, you know, we thought, wow, this is great, we're showing some momentum, but we also need to, to keep perspective. You know, IE is 20 years old, and Edge is eight months old. It's kind of like, you know, still being a, a toddler in some ways. And so we need to have some perspective uh, about how we're doing. And so we thought it'd be interesting to actually go back and look at the last major browser that was introduced on the market. So this is Google Chrome back in 2008. And look at how they did. So this metric is another third party metric from a company called StatCounter. And uh, this is measuring desktop usage share. So this line here is uh, the ramp that Google Chrome got off to in the first seven months can see, you know, pretty, pretty steep uptake. Um, and so what happens if we compare that to Microsoft Edge over the first uh, seven months? So you actually see that, you know, very similar uptake, but actually ahead right now of uh, even the start that Google Chrome, you know, very successful browser has gotten off to. 
So I think in summary, to, to answer the question, uh, we are extremely happy with the start that Microsoft Edge has gotten to. We think we have a lot of momentum. But I think the last piece to any of that story, of course, is you know, we're completely focused on just making sure we can actually keep uh, that momentum going and, and keep the, the, the ramp on that graph there. So as Sean said, a big part uh, to us on, on the team about keeping that momentum going is really listening to the feedback that all of you have, all of our customers around the world have, um, bring that in, internalize it, and really start to improve the product. But we can't just improve the product and internal, internally to Microsoft and then wait months or years before we actually release it to all of you. So this is why, actually, since uh, July the 29th, it's you know, August-ish, uh, we've actually made 12 update releases uh, to Microsoft Edge. In those update releases, we've, we've released over 120 features and over 6,000 bug fixes. So you might be thinking to yourself, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that I've seen 12 Edge updates. And this is kind of by design. Um, a lot of times we don't want users to feel like every time they come back to their computer, they've got a new browser. A lot of these things happen behind the scenes through Windows Update. But that doesn't mean they're not important updates. So one of the really big focus areas for these updates is reliability. So to measure this uh, on the Edge team, we use a metric called crash-free sessions. And this is uh, just like you'd expect. So if a user makes it through, if a user's tab makes it through their browsing session and closes it normally, then that's a crash-free session, and we like that. So the first thing you'll notice is the scale on the, the graph, right? This is 99% to 99.5%. Each tick mark here is five one-hundredths of a percent. And we measure this to uh, one one-hundredth of a percent when, when we look at the numbers here. Because you know, five one hundredths in 150 million users is actually 75,000 people. So every little bit here counts. So how are we doing on uh, crash-free sessions? So this is data from uh, early uh, no, uh, September. You can see we're, we were right around 99.2%. Um, at this point, we had actually already shipped a bunch of updates to Microsoft Edge to get it to this point. So what happened next is we shipped the November update, which most of you probably know was our first major feature update to Windows 10 as well as to Microsoft Edge. And all of you developers know what happens when you introduce a whole bunch of new code into the system is that not everything goes exactly how you planned. And so we actually saw a, a dip in our reliability to just over 99%. And so, of course, this wasn't good enough. We, we rallied, we started looking at the data that was flowing in on the new November update bits, and we started releasing updates. So sometimes as often as twice a month. And since then, you can see that you know, update after update, we're just pushing this number up. And if you look at the trend, we're definitely heading in the right direction. Um, so I'm hoping that next time I show you this graph, instead of 99 and a half being the top metric there, will be 100, and we're actually gonna be approaching that number. Um, so, you know, this is an example of, of what we do with a lot of those updates, but we, of course, also want to deliver new features. So most, but not all of the new features that we've delivered in these updates came in the November update. So this is just a kind of a laundry list of user experience improvements uh, that, that came in November. So hopefully you've seen a lot of these things like tab uh, peak where you can actually, tab preview, sorry, where you can mouse over a tab and see a little snapshot of what's in that tab. Um, F12 docking, which I'm hoping a lot of you enjoy as web developers. Um, and, you know, a bunch of other great, great features, synchronization and so forth. Within the platform itself, we also shipped a bunch of great features, including uh, Object RTC API, which uh, enabled video chat without plugins. So we'll take a look at this later, uh, as well as a, a bunch of other great features. But instead of talking anymore, let's uh, flip over and actually uh, look at a demo. So. Six. All right. So this is a demo of the picture element uh, in Microsoft Edge. So in case you're not familiar with the picture element, uh, this is a new standard that's part of the responsive image suite of standards, which basically allows you as a developer 
to tell the browser how to, uh, which image to select based on a variety of different factors. So uh, this was a demo written by uh, someone on, on the Edge engineering team, uh, Greg Whitworth. And actually, the cooler thing about this is the, the art that's featured in this demo is actually painted by, by his wife, Karen. Um, so the first scenario here um, you can see is that um, one thing you can do with the picture element is to tell the browser to select the right quality of image based on uh, the, the, um, the size of the viewport. So basically, you don't have to choose. Uh, you know, if, you, if the user has a big, high DPI screen, you can send them the highest quality image. If they're on a phone, then you, could, you can save bandwidth and so forth and, and send them the lower quality image. But that's really just the start. Um, you can use uh, things like different codecs as well. So uh, Microsoft Edge on Windows 10 supports JPEG XR, which is a more efficient image compression algorithm. So you can see, for example, in this case, that uh, the same uh, image, uh, the extra large image, for example, from JPEG to JPEG XR is almost half the size. So using the picture element, you don't have to worry if all of your users support JPEG XR. You can just put that on the server, and the browser will figure out the right thing to do. But I think the coolest, um, the coolest feature of all for uh, picture element is something called arc direction. And what this allows you to do is actually select a whole different image based on certain characteristics. So one common scenario is that maybe, especially with responsive websites, is that some of your users are on kind of really wide screens, so maybe on their laptop or their desktop, and so an image like this is actually suitable. Uh, in other cases, um, all, all modern smartphones, you've got a lot of users who are using your site on the complete opposite, a narrow, skinny portrait screen. So what the standard allows you to do here, so you can see in this case the sample code says, uh, if the width of the viewport is less than 700 pixels, then swap it out, and, and the portrait, uh, the orientation is portrait, then swap it out for this vertical version of this image. Uh, so what usually happens here to show this is that someone would take the browser screen and you'd shrink the window and you'd see how it snaps. Um, but instead of doing that, I actually have a much cooler, I think, way to show this off because um, you may or may not have realized, but I have actually been doing this whole demo uh, off a phone. So even though it looks exactly like a PC experience on the screen, you know, I'm using my mouse here to ooh, sc scroll around, um, this is all completely driven off of this phone using Continuum. So this is uh, another feature that we shipped in November, which is Edge for the phone, including Edge um, through Continuum. So you can plug in your phone if you want, if you have a larger screen at home, you can browse um, you know, any website, but no need to have an actual PC or laptop there. So to prove it, what I'm gonna do is just go in here into the display settings and I'm gonna switch Continuum to say mirror what's on my device. So now you're seeing what's on my device. And now I'm just gonna go back into Edge here, exactly the same page, now rendering on the phone. So here's that exact same image now um, using the art, uh, art direction capability of the picture, but now you see that we're seeing the uh, portrait optimized version of the image. So what do you think, is that pretty cool? Awesome, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna hand it back off to Sean. Awesome, thank you. Um, so that's kind of the stuff that we, we worked on and we delivered the many updates up through sort of the, the November update. And now we're gonna go look forward as to sort of what, have been, what have we been doing and what we're targeting to have uh, come for the anniversary update. One of the most important things about the way that we even internally have changed how we build the browser is we organize a lot of our work around listening to customers and learning from them and, uh, about, and, and using that to drive uh, what we focus on. We get a ton of telemetry from uh, devices in the marketplace to tell us how people are using the device. Um, we get feedback, we get thousands and thousands of, of pieces of feedback from customers um, every, almost every day, every month. Um, and we flight, so we flight our, our features out to insiders, fast insiders, and slower uh, insiders, and each of those we use to gather information and data about how we're doing. 
And I want to actually show you a, a, a table which kind of gives some um, PR folks a little bit of nerves. Because this is a chart that uh, is based in, directly on feedback. And it's a chart that we show every week. So we have a weekly meeting in our team. And we sit down and we look at the feedback. And we use this to prioritize the work that we're doing for the product. So <clears throat> this is real. We actually track this through the, about 100 items. And as we're working through them, you know, as, as, as we ship the anniversary update, some of these will drop off. And we'll keep working through these. Um, as you see, you know, provide extension models are our top piece of feedback. Um, but then you get things like, you know, one of the, the, the fun things about building a new browser from scratch is you, there are features you don't bring forward from the previous version, sometimes deliberately, uh, like ActiveX, sometimes because you didn't have time. So people, for example, said, I really need to have an option to choose where I want to have my downloads. It's a feature we had in IE before, and we don't have an edge, but it, it kind of bubbled up to one of the top pieces of feedback we got from customers as a feature take back. Um, we get a lot of individual pieces of feedback that says something crashes or hangs. We kind of group that into, into uh, sort of one line item that we continue to make work on. We, don't, we hope it'll eventually disappear, but the reality is I'm sure it'll always be there. But it's really important for us to, you know, to have that line of sight and say, OK, we're not done yet. It's still a piece of feedback. Hopefully, we'll drop down and other things will come above it. But it's something that we, we hold dearly. We want to make sure that we are always aware of what our customers are saying. You kind of go down the list. Um, these, these actual numbers on the side there are the actual numbers from our internal database where we track all of these things. Um, you can see there's one feature there that we're not actually going to deliver in the uh, anniversary uh, update, which is an uh, enterprise feature for deployment of favorites. We're probably going to deliver it very shortly after that for all the folks who need it. Um, but we're, you know, it's not currently targeted for that release. So you know, we are working through these, and there's some we won't get to, and there's some that we will. Um, and once we're done with this, we'll then shift up and look at the next step. But this is a really core uh, to how we, we operate our, uh, uh, our engineering. So one thing I'll say about this is send feedback. Like, you know, you, some people think that when they send feedback in the tool, we don't hear it. The reality is it's, it drives almost everything we do around uh, prioritizing uh, work. <clears throat> this is uh, another chart that kind of shows um, how we use telemetry. So we've built like this heat map. Uh, that sort of really shows how people use the product, and we use this both as to understand how features are being used. We also use it as sort of as an early warning system. So you know, if we ship an update and um, some feature which was you know consistently used at uh, some known percent kind of drops, then we think, oh, that's maybe something went wrong in the the, the, the feature. So um, we can go and look at that. Um, I was. I had to remove all of the uh, X's because there was some concern that you know, without the context, people might misinterpret them. But one of the ones I left on there actually was a really interesting insight for us. Um, it shows the percentage of times people click zoom and then uh, zoom in and zoom out. And it shows that people click zoom in more than they click zoom out, which is not what we intuitively thought um, and was kind of one of an interesting area. Sorry, zoom. They make things smaller. Uh, more than they make things bigger. And we always thought people would make things bigger. So um, it's not what we intuitively thought, but it's uh, kind of an interesting thing that we, we um, dig into and you know, try to understand and see if it affects the way we design the product. And this data, as, a, as noted below, is sort of anonymous sampled data from, from our insider population. So um, I thought I'd sort of talk a bit about what's coming for, for end users. And I thought the best way to do that is just simply do a bunch of demos. Um, eight. Well, the good news is we're seeing the same thing. There we go. <clears throat> All right. I'm very, very welcome. Excellent. OK. So um, I thought I'd start with showing a few of the changes. A lot of these changes are driven by feedback. So this is our new tab page. Um, it's the page people see when they launch the browser, when they open new tabs. We get a bunch of feedback around uh, these, these sites that people see here. So these are, we call them frequent or top sites. They're based off of the sites you visit frequently. And we got feedback from people that says, well, I'd like to have some control over these sites. And so one of the features that we shipped, and this actually went out in servicing um, so people can do this today, is you can actually drag these around, move them wherever you want to. You can pin, pin them in place. Um, go watch some Netflix. Um, you can argue with our algorithm and say, no, absolutely, I never did go to TMZ.com as much as you think that I did. So I'm going to just remove that one. <laughs> um, you, know, you can add new things. You can you know, 
just decide, well, I, you know, I really know that I'm going to go to CNN a lot, so I can add that. And we go and fetch the fave icon um, from, from the site. Um, and then the other thing you see, we, we actually do pairing with apps. So you app developers out there, if you have a site and uh, an app in the store, we'll actually do automatic pairing between the domain and the site. So in this case, if a user you know, commonly visits CNN, we'll actually tell them, hey, there's an app for that. They can, you can go and download. So CNN, you see it paired, and then MSN and Facebook and Netflix all have paired apps. Um, so that's an important thing that we've done as part of the whole being a part of Windows 10 and the app ecosystem. Um, the other thing we've done is so there's this news feed that you can bring up that's personalized. Um, so you can choose to show it. Uh, you can customize it. Um, you can decide that you, you know, really want to see some money and some entertainment, um, which is definitely what I want to see all the time. Um, more Kardashians are the happier I am. Um, the, and then on the right hand side here is, uh, is, is some personalized content. So you can choose which cards you want to see and automatically picks a set. So the, um, some game with basketball is going on now. I'm just not familiar with it. Um, March Madness. Sorry, March Madness, that's it, thank you. I'm kidding. Um, and so it gives me the scores from that, and it, and, uh, it watches the only stock worth watching, of course. Um, hey, good job. And it tells me the weather back home, so I can call my wife and say, it's sunny in Seattle, I'm confused. Um, it's not supposed to be like that. So we did a bunch of work there. It's a very, these, this page, uh, new tab page, is uh, you know, one of the top pages that um, people use, so uh, it was important for us to get that right. The fact that it's hanging is, uh, is a good feature. Um, and the recovering is telling us about that hang. It's being sent back, so that's I reduced our crash-free sessions by one for today. <laughs> um, so uh, another thing that we've done, this is you know, top feedback that we've had for a really long time. Um, let's say you've, you have, you know, you got some, some URL on, uh, that you have on the clipboard, and you're using your mouse, and you're kind of just relaxed, and you, you don't want to have to lean forward and press enter. You can just you know, press paste and go, and just go. And if it's not a, a URL, you can do, automatically do a search from there. Uh, it's a feedback that we've had for a really long time that people really love, and so we've, we're pretty happy to have that now. Um, another thing we've done is uh, improve um, you know, Cortana. So we talked about how Cortana is there to help you. Um, we've shown you many demos along these lines. We want to show you some of the cool things that have sort of been added. So let's say I'm reading this article about, um, about Pluto and whether Pluto is a planet. And I'm curious about this solar system thing. So I just click on you know, system here and say ask Cortana. One of the clever things she does is she didn't give me an answer for the word system. She just kind of looked around what I had there and figured, oh, what I probably wanted was an answer for solar system. So it pulls together this answer for full solar system. Um, but one of the really cool things is, you know, we have a bunch of different things in here. So for example, for really, I can get this little, you know, thing going right there, which kind of gives me a sense of what's going on in the solar system. Um, and then, oh, look, there's Pluto, dwarf planet. So I guess that answers the question. Uh, so Pluto's a dwarf planet. So that's one of the kinds of things we've added. We've also added um, some more functionality around um, you know, Cortana being able to you know, help you when you go to places on the web. So here I went to Best Buy, and this thing in the top left, uh, right-hand corner popped up, saying, can I interest you in a coupon? And what we've done is for a certain number of sites, so we have coupons available only if they're coupons that day. Cortana can basically offer you um, you know, save you some time, save you some money, you don't have to go searching. I know my wife, like, just before she buys, she basically stops and goes and types Best Buy coupons into her favorite search engine, and then she refuses to buy anything that doesn't have a coupon, so this kind of saves her some time. Um, so this is kind of a thing we've added over time, like it just came online uh, a few months ago. Um, and there are other sort of features like that that we've, that we've brought online, and we'll continue to do so. Um, <clears throat> Another popular feature that uh, people are interested in, I'm going to go to uh, Microsoft.com. Office looks good. Oh, this Microsoft Edge thing looks interesting. Um, yeah, it's got some web notes, some pen, and it looks really interesting. We're going to keep going. Oof, look at it beat all the other browsers in performance. Did, did you know that it was fast? You did know yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then I get here, and if I was on a tablet um, or you know, a touch screen, you know, one of, the, one of the very popular features we actually had back in uh, sort of the modern IE version for Windows 8 was uh, back forward swipe. And so now I can just basically go on the page and I can swipe back, go to the previous page. 
And this is really awesome because it works for thumbs. The best thing about it actually is it also works with the touchpad. So I just take two fingers and just swipe to the left, swipe left, so I can just keep my hand right there on the touchpad and go back and forth. Uh, it's one of those things, once you use it, you can't live without it. Very excited that that's coming. Um, another feature that's there, um, it's actually available already in the November update, is tab preview. So when I'm looking to figure which is the tab that I want to go to, uh, it, can, it just gives me a quick preview of the tab so I can switch back and forth. And then, of course, uh, we, we did something called uh, extensions. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, look into that. Um, so I'm going to start by doing the world's first public demo of installing an extension from the store. Um, so I'm going to click on install. So go into the store. So what's going to happen right now, if you pick up one of our insider builds, we have a site that we've set up where you can go and, and get an XE that will install the extensions. Um, while we sort of get the store up and running. And the store is going to be up and running pretty soon. Um, so, <clears throat> um, but this is uh, just going to show you what that experience will be like. Users will go to the store. They'll have a selection to pick from. They can search. It'll pop up like if they went to the store and just typed, you know, a, a, a name of a popular extension, it will just show up the way they expect it to. So, um, so now I've installed that. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to go over. This one always gives me a little bit of fun. Like it usually takes two launches before it works, and which again proves that it's not a fake PowerPoint demo. There you go. Um, so that's uh, the page analyzer extension, which uh, is a, actually a Microsoft built extension, which I think web developers will really enjoy because what it does is it takes a page and it analyzes it for uh, interoperability, and then they've recently added some features where it analyzes it for accessibility as well. So you can actually take your page and say, you know, how am I doing on the various accessibility uh, guidelines. So I wanted to take a quick dive into one of the extensions and just uh, give, give you a sense of what that's like so you, so you have a, you know, what, what, what these things really are. So we have this extension that's built. It's a fun extension called Redactor. Um, now I'll uh, show you quickly what it does. Uh, this may not be in our first uh, selection. So let's say I go to some site, and you know what? I'm really loving this political season. That's sarcasm. I'm not at all. Um, and there's redactor button. What it, what, it, what it does is it takes a set of text that you've provided it, and it blacks them all out on the page. And frankly, I think it makes this page much more readable. Um, <laughs> and this is an equal opportunity blackout, just so we know. Um, <laughs> but it's like, ah, oh, these names of people that I'm just getting tired of reading. So um, one of the things, though, if I were to go over like another site, is the way it's built, it requires that I always have to go press that button to make this happen. So I'm just going to pop open the... Uh, the extension in uh, Visual Studio Code and kind of show you what that looks like. So first I'll show you the manifest. So this is the manifest that pretty much just describes what that extension does. And one of the things it does is it defines that browser action, um, which is the, the what's that? Okay, control plus. Make it bigger. Oh, make it bigger. Oh, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> it defines that, um, the browser action, which is the button. And it basically says, okay, when somebody presses that button, go run some JavaScript code. And I'll switch over and take a look at that code. Um, Control. control plus. There we go. And I'm showing you this because I'm pretty much, well, you know, those are the people, these are the, the, the texts that it blocks to see equal opportunity. I'm showing you this because it's basically like most people who've used built a website of any kind will look at this like, oh, I understand what that's doing. It's, you know, it's, it's, if, if it sees that text, go draw, uh, style it with a black box around it. Like, and this is what extensions are. Like they've moved from being these calm objects um, that you had to basically be a you know, professional, Microsoft professional developer. Not that I had a problem with you being a Microsoft professional developer. Um, that's good, thank you. But you know, pretty much anybody can build one of these things because it uses the same technologies and the same concepts as, as, um, as, as the web. So what I'm going to do is I, I've decided I, I don't want to have to um, um, always press the button to make it work. So instead of using that function above that's sort of wired up to the button, um, I'm just going to, whenever the page loads, um, I'll just have it run the function. So I'll hit save on that, go back to the page, hit refresh, and then see, now any page I go to, I will be saved from uh, being hit with all these people. Um, so that gives you kind of a sense of, of what the extension is like, how it works, it's super lightweight. And uh, I'll show you some of the extensions that we're currently working on. I'll um, just sort of load, show you a few of them. Um, so many of these will be coming shortly. 
Uh, so this is you know, Adblock Plus. People are familiar with this one. Um, and then you know you can never have too many ad blockers, so I'll just load ad block as well. Um, and then we have that coming. We have one from OneNote coming sh shortly. All these you can see they're actually they're generally working. Um, we're hoping for the next Insider flight. Uh, when that comes, we will have some of these extensions available for people to use. And uh, our friends from Pinterest uh, have. Uh, a pin, the pin it button, which is a very popular extension as well. So this gives you a sense of some of the extensions that, that we're working on actively in progress and will soon be available for people to, to use and then will be in the store as well. Um, so I want one more thing before I, I finish that. Uh, many of these extensions were developed by some of the folks in this room, some of the folks right here are working on, including, and I won't mention his name because he'll get embarrassed, one of them who's getting married tomorrow. So can we all, uh, can we get a little applause? <laughs> Applause for him. Thank you very much. He did all this work while preparing for his wedding. It's just, yeah, couldn't happen for me. Um, so just really quickly, I wanted to just recap on, on um, extensions and give people a sense of what's sort of happening with this, because we know it's a top issue for people. So the way we're work developing this is we're working a close set of partners to kind of prove out the platform. Frankly, every time we've onboarded a new extension, it's found new bugs uh, in the platform for us. And so each one is a kind of a process and of, of, of making the platform better. And so we're working slowly and deliberately to make sure that we, when we deliver these extensions, that they actually are, they meet the criteria that we have. The reason we sort of went to new platform was to have a more secure, reliable, and, and, and performant um, browser. So we want to make sure that as these new extensions come along, we meet the same. So this is a selection of the folks that we're working with. Um, really happy to work with them. So a small set of them available today, like literally today, if you go uh, get the Insider Preview, you can try out Translator, Mouse Gestures, and the Reddit Enhancement Suite. And then a few more will come online, and then we'll sort of keep bringing them faster and faster uh, over the next few weeks. If you are building an extension and you're interested in sort of getting on our list, we have a URL. It's here. We'll make it public on uh, the uh, Edge Dev blog as well for you to uh, click through. It's also on the uh, dev.microsoftedge.com website. You can get there. You, you know, it's a simple forum to, for you to let us know about your extension and that you're interested in being part of the early set. Um, so that's it for, I mean, there's lots of other new features. There's small features. Done a ton of work about improving favorites uh, management in the browser. Uh, we have a whole new uh, tree view. We have a, we've done a ton of work um, in really small and large ways, and we continue to do work. So if there's a, anything that you want to know, just ask about. But otherwise, you know, send feedback. So thanks. Hand over. All right. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to switch gears now and uh, really look at the core platform, Edge HTML, uh, that powers both uh, Microsoft Edge as well as the web app platform in Windows 10. Uh, so I'm going to start by just kind of setting the context at a high level about uh, the, the priorities that we put in front of the team about what we wanted to accomplish in 2016. So you can see them here, extensions that Sean just showed you. Accessibility is a huge focus for us, uh, fundamentals, so uh, the reliability work I showed earlier, security, performance, uh, always moving forward with web standards, uh, and then finally really figuring out how we more closely uh, work with all of you as web, the web developers to make sure your feedback is heard and incorporated uh, into the product. But I'm not gonna say a whole lot more about this. I'm gonna actually just dive a little bit into the, the last one because um, hopefully for some of you, these priorities are not uh, a surprise. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, we actually published these to uh, the Microsoft Edge dev blog. So you can get to this at blog.microsoftedge.com. So um, this was February the 3rd. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the, exactly the same five priorities that I just outlined. We published them you know, basically days after we had sent them out to the team internally. Um, so this is really kind of in the spirit of us just being as open as possible about where we're headed. Uh, of course, that's not the only thing. Uh, just a few, uh, a month or so before that, we made a pretty huge announcement, which was that uh, Chakra Core, which is the JavaScript engine which powers Microsoft Edge, uh, was made open source. So you can go find it uh, on GitHub. You can see that it's already over 5,000 uh, stars. Uh, this is amazing because not just is this going to help Microsoft Edge, but another thing that the Chakra team did was um, right around the same time submit a pull request uh, to uh, allow Node to run on top of Chakra. So you can actually take, take advantage of the new features, the performance that's in Chakra in other scenarios like uh, cloud, in the cloud with Node or in IoT scenarios. 
Uh, so this was a pretty big step uh, for, for JavaScript. Uh, stepping back a little further, we uh, also open sourced all of our demos. So these are uh, what we call test drives. So whenever we release new features, we often have new demo showcases to show them off. And uh, we thought, you know, instead of just publishing the demos themselves, why don't we actually open up the source code so that we can actually receive uh, feedback and contributions from the community. Uh, the last one I'll call out now is the status roadmap, platform status. So this is kind of the site that, that started our big foray into openness a couple years ago. And one of the big pieces of feedback we got was that, hey, this is great. Um, it's great to see your backlog, all of these items that are you know, under consideration. But it would be great to have a little more visibility into what's kind of popping to the top and what's most close to getting flipped into under development. And so we added this field here. It's pretty subtle, but it's important, called roadmap priority. Uh, which will be high, medium, or low. And this really gives you an idea of how imminent we think a given feature is to being implemented in Edge. So we really hope all of this information helps you plan ahead what technologies you're going to adopt. Of course, you know, if you have feedback, click on the user voice link that's uh, in the status site. Hit us up on Twitter. You know, lots of different ways to reach us. So in the next update, the anniversary update, got to get used to saying that, um, we, of course, have a ton of new features coming to Edge HTML. Um, so here's a selection of them. I think the main thing to note here is that these are going to map very directly into the priorities that I showed a couple of slides ago. So you see a whole bunch of accessibility improvements, like high contrast or API mappings. Uh, you see some fundamental stuff, so usually not, not considered um, new web platform features. But I did call out one important one here, which is Flash out of process. So uh, in the anniversary update, actually, in current Windows Insider flights, Flash is now running in a separate process to uh, the, the Edge tab. And what this means is you know, if Flash crashes or if it uh, becomes under, uh, comes under attack of malicious software, then we're actually better able to protect uh, the web content that's running in that tab. Uh, in addition to that, we have a whole bunch of uh, new web standard features, things like FIDO, uh, web notifications, a lot of uh, really cool stuff that we'll take a look at in a second. So it's, it can be hard to look at a big you know, word cloud of features like that and get a feeling for what it all means. You know, what, you know, how is Edge actually doing as a platform? So one interesting way to do that is to use a benchmark like HTML5 test. So most of you have probably seen this. Um, it's actually not an official W3C benchmark, uh, and it doesn't really uh, measure the quality of how well each browser implemented a standard, but it's still kind of an interesting way to zoom out and get an aggregate picture. So uh, over the past couple years, you can see from IE 11 through uh, the November update of Edge, we've made huge progress from you know, 336 points all the way through 458. But that's kind of old news. So how are things looking today? So we actually compared the latest builds of Edge against the nightly builds of other browsers that we think are going to release around the same time. And uh, the kind of big news that we noticed here is that we had actually leapfrogged um, the latest Firefox nightly uh, into second place on this benchmark. Um, this is coming from you know, well down in, in last place. And so, um, you know, again, we're, we're really happy about the momentum. You know, there's, we, we realize there's still one more step to take, and we're really focused on that. Uh, so with that, with that, I'm going to just flip over and do a couple of demos to show you uh, what's coming up in the, in the platform. All right, so the first one uh, is biometric login using a technology called FIDO 2.0. So you actually saw some of this in the keynote this morning with Brian Roper. He actually showed the same uh, demo site that we built in conjunction with our partners at USAA. Um, however, I think personally that he kind of skipped the coolest part of the demo, which is to use a fingerprint uh, to unlock the website. I think it's much cooler, actually, if you could use your face. And um, you can. So let me show that. So FIDO stands for uh, Fast Identity Online. And they're a uh, standards body that is really uh, invested in uh, helping online authentication become a lot more secure and, uh, and convenient for users. So what this really means is we need to get rid of passwords. So if you have one password, 
that you use all across your sites, that's not secure. If you have you know, 20 really complex passwords uh, that you use across a variety of sites and you've got a sticky note, actually the sticky note's not very secure. So you, can, you know the problems with, with web login as it stands today. So Fido and, and browser makers are really out to solve this. So what's happening now is I'm just going through a registration flow. So imagine that I already have an account. Um, I'm confirming that it's me, but now it's detected that I'm on a Windows Hello enabled machine. So I'm gonna say yes, I'd love to start using Windows Hello. It's gonna pop up. I'm gonna lean over here. It's gonna recognize me. Uh, and I'm gonna say okay, so now I'm, I'm registered. So the great thing to know about this is that no information, no confidential information, like no facial scan or anything like that has been sent to USAA. They've just gotten the minimal information they need to know that, to do a key exchange later on with, uh, with FIDO. So you can imagine now in the future, you know, I log off and then the next day I come back and I want to log into my bank. And so again, this is similar to what, what Brian showed, but uh, instead of using a finger, which is so last year, I'm just gonna again, Lean over here, it's gonna recognize me, and voila, I'm gonna get logged into my bank. So what do you think? Is that the future of how you wanna log into all your websites? <laughs> Definitely. Okay, cool, so uh, the second demo I wanna show is uh, a couple of technologies. The first one is um, ORTC, so this is a technology that we actually shipped back in November to do uh, video chat without any plugins. And so we actually built this, uh, this technology in conjunction with the Skype team. They partnered with us both through the standards process as well as the actual building of the feature. Um, and it allows you to do Skype on the web. So you can see here you've got chat, um, but you've also got video here. And, and in the past this has required a plug-in or WebRTC 1.0, but now with the new Skype for Web experience, uh, I can chat with Sean even though he's right beside me here. Um, you know, we like to use our technology. Hey, there we go. So there he is, hey, it's working. So wait, this is using <laughs> just web technologies. Just web technologies, it's amazing. <laughs> All right, so that was kind of awkward. Um, <laughs> so I'm here for it. <laughs> uh, so the other cool thing that the Skype team has done uh, in partnership with us is to be an early adopter of web notifications. So web notifications is a new standard that allows you to basically pop OS native notifications uh, through the web. And so instead of having to draw your own divs and, and pop them up over your page, you can actually just, uh, he's, he's jumping ahead in the demo, and he says, is this where I fit Brad Pitt into the session? So I know even though I was on another tab that I can go over here and say, can we get a vote on this? Do we need some Brad Pitt? I think that's a no, well, I, I didn't, <laughs> oh. Don't empower, do not empower him. I think you see last year's talk, the cons... <laughs> The con consensus was no. Sorry. <laughs> so um, yeah, again, very cool. You know, in addition to just being less code to write, this also allows it to uh, notifications to pop from your website, even if the browser or the tab is in the background, so you don't have to worry about you know the user going off and doing different things. Um, so again, very cool uh, new technology coming to the Edge platform. All right. So there's a lot more uh, coming to the platform. Uh, if you want to see more, see more codes, see more demos, definitely please check out uh, the session on Friday at 12.30 with Jacob Rossi and David Katui. They're gonna take uh, you know, a lot of those features that you saw on that slide and give you a much more in-depth look at how you use them uh, what they can do for you. Uh, if you just want to see some more demos, then uh, come see me in the mini theater. Otherwise, there's also a bunch of deep dive sessions on JavaScript, on the F12 tools uh, that will be online uh, shortly. If you really want to know more, then you can come join us on Monday. So we're actually going to be just down the street uh, holding our second annual Microsoft Edge Web Summit. So this is going to be a day of 
uh, 30-minute sessions delivered from the Edge engineering team to web developers. Uh, we actually scheduled it as close to po as possible to build so that hopefully some of you can make it. Uh, you can check out the full schedule here on Lanyard. Uh, if you are interested and somehow missed it and didn't get a free registration, uh, we are sold out and, and registration is closed. But if you really want to make it, please come see me afterwards and uh, I can get you an invite. Okay, so let's switch gears again. Uh, enterprise. So uh, as, as Sean mentioned, we have two browsers in Windows 10. And a big reason for that is our enterprise customers. We actually hope that most regular users only see Edge. It's pinned to the taskbar uh, versus IE that's kind of buried in Windows accessories. And the reason for that is enterprise really needs that backwards compatibility for sites that were written you know, in the year 2000 using ActiveX and some of these older technologies. And so by shipping the two browsers, we allow Edge to be really focused on forward-leaning technology while we can still have IA on the box for those customers that uh, really need it. So the question is, you know, are our customers responding to this uh, strategy, to this, to this approach? Uh, the answer is yes. So actually, we had to take a step back and realize that um, get going from IA to IE 11 to Edge was actually, we weren't even ready to think about that yet. So a year ago, when we surveyed all of our enterprise customers, we found that only 25% uh, 20, of them were on IE 11, only 25%. And that's because we were, shipping, we were shipping and supporting four different versions of IE on Windows 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So something we announced 18 months ago was that we were gonna change the support policy so that we only support the latest version of IE on any given operating system. So that, that means that as of uh, January the 12th, a couple of months ago, IE 11 was the only uh, browser supported on, uh, on, on Windows 7. So since then, our field staff has been at work around the world trying to help these customers get upgraded to I-11. So we've actually gone from 25% to over 70% uh, with the, those same customers in just one year. So we still have a little ways to go, but this is amazing progress to get people to more modern web browsers. In addition, we want people to start evaluating Microsoft Edge for the rest of their internet browsing. And so we're, we're also seeing some great momentum here. So from a survey of some of our closest enterprise partners, we're seeing that almost 60% of them are planning to actually deploy or test Microsoft Edge within 2016. So we've got a bunch of great enterprise features. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through these pretty quickly because we don't have a lot of time. So enterprise mode basically allows you to, um, to set some sites into a mode that, that is really high fidelity IEA compatibility. Um, along with that, we have this ability to, to work uh, between Edge and IE uh, together. Um, so I'm actually just gonna skip ahead to the demo here so that we can just see these features in, in action. All right. All right, there we go. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, the group policy editor uh, on a machine. And I've got a particular policy called um, use the enterprise mode IE website list. And what this is is a, sorry, let me flip to the correct thing. So what this is is you're, you're basically saying I want uh, to, to send out, to, to put out on my network a list of sites that require great backward compatibility. They were written a long time ago. We don't want to update them yet, and we just want them to keep on working. So in this case, this is all specified by this XML file here that you can see specified. And then we publish a tool called the Enterprise Mode Site List Manager, which allows you to add and remove sites from that list. So in this case, I have a couple of sites. You can imagine this is an internal purchase ordering site and an internal travel site that, again, haven't been updated yet, so I want them to write, run in IE8 enterprise mode. So once you save this, it actually just writes out the XML file that you put out on your network, and then, and then all of your users download it in your enterprise. Uh, along with that, we've also 
uh, in the anniversary update, we're going to support a new policy called send all sites uh, not included in the enterprise list mode, to, uh, enterprise mode list to Microsoft Edge. So that's a lot of words. What does it mean? So what we were seeing is people would get handed off through the existing functionality from Edge to IE because they hit some internal site that needed it, and then they would kind of get stranded there because they didn't realize that their browsers got switched. And so what this does is allows you to say, okay, if the user goes to any site other than the ones that are on the list in IE, then just pop them back, back over to Edge. So let's see what that looks like. So actually the first thing I'm going to show is a new, new page that we created in November called About Compat. So if you go to About colon Compat in, in Edge or IE, you can actually start to view this list. So I'm going to uncheck the public Microsoft compatibility list. And you can see that the enterprise list that I just showed with those two sites is showing up here. So now you can imagine that you know, I'm, a, I'm on a website. I'm doing my normal web browsing. Uh, and then I want to go book uh, some business travel. So I'm going to go to this, in, this internal travel site. Ooh, interesting. And so uh, you can see that it, it kind of pretty seamlessly popped me over into Internet Explorer, and I can go ahead and, and do what I need to do. Uh, you might notice that over on Edge, nothing happened. So in current, uh, in, in the November update, we used to leave an interstitial page that says, hey, we had to pop you over to IE. A lot of people got confused by that, and, and customers just wanted to just have it happen without, um, without that interstitial. So we enabled that. And then now that I'm in IE, if I then decide to go to an internet site like MSN, you can see now it's kind of popped me back over and said, hey, you know, you're, you're back on the internet. I should just push you back over to Edge because that's a lot faster, uh, you know, has a lot more features and so forth. Um, so that's how we expect uh, our, our enterprise users to, to work between these two modes of having Edge deployed as their default browser, but having IE kind of in the background to handle those sites that need it. Okay, so I'm running short on time, so I'm going to start going pretty quick. But another important topic to cover is web apps. So you saw a lot of this in the, in the keynote, so I'll, I'll just review. So um, in Windows 10, we really changed, changed strategy with web apps. So instead of thinking and asking web developers to actually package up their web content um, and ship it through the store in that way, we moved to this model that we call hosted web apps, which basically means hey, you as a developer get to just keep on building your website as you always have. You deploy it to the cloud, um, and your website runs on it. And now we're going to enable you to submit an app, but really all that app is is a manifest with a URL in it. So in this case, mysite.com. The great thing about doing this is that as soon as you do that and your website is running in an app context, you automatically have access to all of the universal Windows platform APIs. Um, so you started to see this this morning in, in the keynote. And then from there, you pack, package that Apex up and, and send it to the store. As a developer, nothing changes, though. If you want to make an update, you just push to the cloud, and your app is automatically updated. So we're seeing a ton of momentum here. You saw this in the keynote. A lot of big names uh, are, are adopting this. Over 50% of the new web apps coming to the store are actually using this model versus the old packaged web apps model. So we're really doubling down on this technology. Uh, a couple of big improvements coming in the anniversary update. The first one is support for Xbox. So you saw that universal apps are coming to the Xbox. So we've done some work to make sure that um, input works correctly, including support for GamePad API, as well as some libraries and so forth to, to hook in uh, directional navigation using the controller or mouse mode uh, work well. The second thing we've done is really simplify publishing. So in the past, even though it's, there's not much in the Apex package, you still had to install Vis Visual Studio. But now you can actually just create a zip file with your manifest, a few images for your tile, um, and then rename it to a .web file and upload it to the store, and that's all it takes to publish a web app. Uh, no tools, no special tools required. So if you want to learn more about this, lots of great content, please um, see Jeff Bertoft and Curl session uh, tomorrow at 3.30, as well as their mini theater, um, which is really cool. It's called Magic Mirror, which is a web app 
uh, powered by a Raspberry Pi. All right, I think I've given you about one minute to, to finish up. So this is just to wrap up. I mean, you, what we've basically been talking about is what we've done up to this point, stuff you can go out right now, pick up an insider preview, or if you're using the current retail version, you can try out. We've given you some insight in how we think about what we're building, the, the, our, our, our uh, emphasis on feedback, on telemetry, on community relationships, on basically connecting with the customers, developers, partners to understand what we should build, and then iterating quickly, releasing updates as quickly as we can to kind of um, get those out to customers. So, um, so if there's a you know, recap, it's, you know, we've had a great first year, we're really proud of the uh, work, and, and we're, people who supported us are um, you know, really grateful for that. Um, we're listening and continuing to improve links, so please use the feedback app. Please use the tools to tell us what you want us to improve. Um, and then there's, we have lots of improvements coming. This is how you can connect with us. So uh, the core website, MarkSoftEdge.com, for developers, our blog, user voice for voting, um, status on Microsoft Edge, which gives you the roadmap of all the features that are coming. If you're a consumer or if you're just sitting on Windows 10 and you want to give us some feedback, give us feedback using the feedback hub, um, which is available on Windows 10 for insiders. Um, and like I said, we listen when that feedback flows on near real time to us. And then you can find us on Twitter at uh, Microsoft Edge and at uh, MS Edge Dev. And there are a lot of members of the team who are also on Twitter as well who you can reach out to. Um, please complete an evaluation form. Um, thank you very much. And questions? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>